Today's program has been brought to you by TechServe, New York's original and still the best Apple computer, iPod, and iPhone store and repair shop. For more information, visit TechServe.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky tunes. Coming in with a... Yeah? Coming in with a bullet? Yeah, coming in with a bullet. Ending on a bullet. 
Yeah. Welcome to the 150th episode of um, Snacky Dunes. Uh, is that what it's called? It's studio audience. This is going to be just an hour of bloopers, uh, <laughs> call-ins, uh, thanks for the memories. Yeah, we got, um, we got our top five 36-second uh, interviews. <laughs> uh, we're really excited. To, um, we've been working on this show since we started the first one, wow. if you really think about it. Um, the only work we're doing today is decimating pizzas, which we've, with the well, help of really quick work. Scott and Justin from Turing Machine, we put, put down almost three full pizzas in six minutes? Six minutes. Sure. That, that last one, I think, is my favorite. Yeah. Yeah, it's got those slices of green peppers that remind me of uh, pizza from growing up. Yes. Um, so welcome. Thank you for having us. Justin, second time? Second time. Scott, first time? First time. First time guest, no time listener? <laughs> uh, no, I listened to... I think I, I, think I, listened, yeah, yeah. I, think I listened to Justin's show, so, okay. you know. Um, and it, big, is, it is known as my show. Yeah. And can we send a big shout-out to Mama Bresnitz and Papa Bresnitz? Happy anniversary yesterday. Oh, yeah, but happy Mom, anniversary. Hey. Yeah. 34 years. 34, 34 years. years. But Mom, who's in the kitchen right now cooking Passover dinner, which we are uh, going to hop in the car after this and drive to Philly. Sweet. And eat gefilte fish. So how how long have you two known each other? 1991, so 22 years, I guess. Jesus. Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of nuts. Nice. Um, and why don't you run through the, the projects you've worked together? Uh, Can we talk about how they met? We'll get there. <laughs> um, well, we've been in two bands together, like two real bands that have made records. Uh, first band was in D.C. called Pitch Blend. That's Pitch Blend, one word with an E at the end. And <laughs> I didn't realize it was that always spelling, yeah, Basically, yeah. You, every time you tell someone what band you're in, you'd have to add that to it. Yeah. And then we moved to New York, uh, kind of within a few months of each other. Yeah, and 90, 90, I moved in December '94, and you moved what? June, January, uh, February, March, 95? March '95. March '95. March '95. And then late '90s, we started a band called Turing Machine, which is always kind of meant to be more of a project than a full time band. And uh, put out three records in Turing Machine and three records in Pitch Blend. And currently, you guys do what now? Uh, I was a wine buyer at a retail shop for about eight years, and now I'm a partner in a wine importing company with my friend Zev Rovine and my friend Laurent Bonbois, and uh, we sell wine to retail and restaurants in New York City and to other distributors in America. Is it? Is it? I heard it's a law that you need to have some guy named Laurent if you're going to do a wine business <laughs> in the States. I heard. We lucked out. We got a good Laurent, too, yeah. so we kind of lucked out. A nice uh, vintage one? Yeah. Right. He's handsome. <laughs> Smart, oh, yeah. speaks great English. And he's from the Laurent region, right? Yes, he is from the Laurent. <laughs> he lives next to the Laurent River. <laughs> nice. And yeah. Scott? Um, I came to New York and kind of stumbled into a magazine career, writing, editing, and now I am at Bon Appetit Magazine, a special projects editor, which is kind of a title we kind of made up. But uh, Those are the best kinds. Give, us, give an example of a special project. Well, we have an iPad edition, and I'm the editorial overseer of that. And mm. then, uh, what else? Special project. Uh you know, website. An of. official bearer of uh, salsa. Oh, yes. I, yeah. I brought a couple <laughs> things off the free table. A can of salsa. Oh, thank you. And, uh, you keep iterating that it's free. Like, you want to... I got it. Like, we got it. You yeah. didn't spend a dime on us. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank really you. good, guys. We couldn't have told you episode 150 enough to hint at, like, gifts, champagne, I took prizes. a couple of things off the expensive table. Oh, there it is. Thank oh, you. I feel so good. So let's, take it out of his paycheck. Okay. So, so let's go back to the beginning. Okay. How did young whippersnapper Justin and young scuttlebutt Scott... <laughs> Meet ninety one ninety one ninety one. I was playing, um, sort of making recordings with my friend, with my friend who I worked in a record store with. And hold we, on, ninety one DC working in a record store. I know, hard to believe. How how much black or plaid were you wearing at the time? I think I was wearing a fair amount of, of grunge chic, which <laughs> is looking out at the crowd at Roberta's, pretty much the same gear. It's twenty year cycle. Exactly, it's true. But um, but. Uh, so I, we put back then, you know, no internet, no nothing like that. So we put an ad in the newspaper before the before the, like in the free alt weekly yeah, well, before very, the very back, before the back pages were just you know ads for prostitutes. No, there would actually be ads. Before it got page. good, yeah, <laughs> before it got real good. <laughs> so and uh, Scott and another guy answered, and we ended up you know it actually worked. Like we we got together and jammed, and the first time we played, I think we wrote like three or four of the songs that were on our first record. Who's the other guy? Uh, there was a I was. Uh, there's a guy named Pat Goff that was a drummer, and the guy I was playing with is named Triops Trafford. And what are, what, are, what are Pat and Triops doing? Triops is a visual artist in L.A., and I don't know. What's Pat do? Pat works for a transportation think tank in D.C. and plays in a band called uh, Imperial China. That's true. So you guys all have all, you know, you're not dead. 
No. No. Yeah. We're closer to it, but yeah. we are not. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so you guys survived. And so what? So take us through Pitch Plan. What happened? I, I mean, you know, it was such a fun time. It was the indie rock time. I mean, there was, there was right around the time everybody figured out that you could put out your own music. So lots of people, there were just tons of bands, tons of records. People were very excited. You know, you, we just would, there, there wasn't a huge commercial, the independent scene wasn't really commercial. So at that time, if we wanted to go on tour in October, we'd start calling people in August, right. maybe even September, and book like a, a two or three week tour and go. Did and you just have met. like a notebook of just like guys? Yeah. yeah. And then we got a booking agent later. But when it started, when it started, I just pop a seven inch in the mail and somebody would call you back. And you you would uh, at that time maximum rock and roll had had the uh, the uh, book your own. Am I allowed to swear on this? Yeah, yeah. Book your own. Book your own life. fucking life. And that actually, I think the second tour we we may have yeah. used but, that. But the first yeah. one, I remember just Justin calling people uh, from his work phone. Yeah, I had I just, Olsen's book and records, and uh, we had told the story the other day, but <laughs> he called me and said, hey, I got us a show in Denver. I was like, that's great. How much? He said, I'm not sure. He set a scene up. That's 100, right? It's like, I had no idea, yeah. <laughs> but, like, but, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, like these, And we would play, like, legitimate places. We weren't playing basements and or house shows or anything. Like, we were playing bars with, like, meals and people there. And you, d- you never pe- did you'd the- call You'd call somewhere, and they'd be like... Well, we'll put you on the shellac show or whatever. It was just like it was totally. That was just it was just the way it worked. It was it was really strange. And because your you know because your rent was two hundred fifty dollars a month or right. whatever and it was, you, it was gas. not it was not very hard to. Yeah, and gas was super cheap. It wasn't yeah. actually that hard to come back and have a month's rent and the month rent that you just paid for. I, I literally got my driver's license the year that gas went above eighty nine cents, and I was like, oh, maybe to go back down. So anyway, yeah. Uh, so and all that driving you too, yeah, and all that. Dri- <laughs> well, you know, when I was you know younger ish. So you never did the whole sleep on couch basement. Oh, show. oh, yeah, anyway. oh okay. okay. Yeah. Slept, I mean, that's all we did was because you just on made couches. it seem like. So you played the show, played the show. Then you would announce that the, for the last song, you'd say you had stuff for sale, and then you'd say, "Hey, if anyone has some extra space, we're four or five clean living guys, and uh, we'd love a place to stay and come see us afterward." And most of the time, somebody would. There come was always see somebody afterward. in every town who was like, "I'm the guy that lets band sleep at his place." Yeah, I come also, back to my house and watch this weird Sun Ya uh, Sun Ra documentary with me, man. <laughs> I refer to that guy as the Sun Ra guy because he existed in many different every towns. single city. Uh, no, uh, no tour romance stories. Yeah. <laughs> I love Dude, have, I you love heard, have you heard the Pitch Blend records? <laughs> yeah. Yes. It was like they were really, they were uh, thinking about this. It's almost like we <laughs> were trying to see how we could alienate anyone that could possibly listen to our band by making a collection of inside jokes and, and, and atonal songs. Did and any girl it, show? And it totally worked. Any yeah. girl show up to the show? No. no. Um, if they came, they came with their boyfriends, yeah. and, uh, they, and they also dressed like dudes, so you couldn't tell they were women. Yeah. Unless they had a zine to sell. Maybe they'd show up to sell their zine. So <laughs> so let's uh, let's fast forward through Pitch Blend. You guys... Hold on, wait. Do you have a Pitch Blend song? I could, I could play like a hit, a hit, a relative hit. Let's, let's hear, a, let's okay. hear a, pit, a hit. Here's a hit.
of the nineties. Pitch, pitch Flood with an E. So, uh, so wait, um, was that on seven inch cassette? That was on a CD and LP, actually. Oh, oh uh, did it self released or what label? It was on Cargo Headhunter, which is like the same label drive like Jay Who was on. Stuff Ooh, like that. but the, we, X. The, way, the way we got signed is actually kind of a cool story that talks about the old days too. Because we sent a cassette demo to the CMJ magazine, which was actually really important at the time, and they put it on the cover as best new music, and then we got letters in the mail from record labels. Yes, when like, things like just very like old major labels, like m- stuff. move slowly. Just well, how long did that take? Yeah. The whole thing probably took maybe you have a PO box. probably six six weeks, probably. Like the whole thing from when we sent it to when we saw it? Yeah. Yeah, about six weeks. As opposed to like a band goes up on Stereo Gum and gets into a bidding war in like 24 hours? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, there was no, six bid- weeks there was no bidding war. Six <laughs> weeks is still pretty fast. Well, it was all, it was all horseback then, too. Yeah. So it's and, then, and then you guys quit your jobs, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the great thing about DC was uh, after we kind of started going on tour, this, after the second tour, we never had like the same job. And DC is full of temp jobs. So we all worked for like the government. Uh, I believe Triops, our guitar player, had a job where he had to go to the Coke plant and shake six packs of Coke to see if they if they had <laughs> the leaks. The bottles were broken or leaked. <laughs> I I worked uh, at a drug testing lab reporting results. Yeah, <laughs> I remember there's a gas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and what what were you eating at the time? Because uh, we saw it's really funny. You guys I, were to well, say I, the least. I think about I think about those times a lot because I don't seem to have very many food memories of Washington D.C. Um, it's mostly because we were broke, but I mean, we also lived in group houses, and I remember cooking a lot, but I don't, I mean, there was like, I remember lots of pizza. There was a place called Armand's that had a $5 all-you-can-eat pizza buffet, and we would go there. Oh, oh, that's great. A deep dish, deep dish. We wow. just, Justin and I shared a house with some people for about a year, mm-hmm. and occasionally we'd, we'd cook together, and we'd, we kind of grew up in a similar way, kind of Italian-American family, like, like Sunday sauce kind of thing, and we, we did yeah. that a couple times, but... It was uh, DC, same here. I don't have a whole lot of memories other than going to Burrito Brothers occasionally. Oh, them. Burrito Brothers. Yeah, yeah, getting, yeah, yeah. Getting that would be a big night. 4,000 calorie uh, thing of uh, we would, rice and beans. Any yeah. good uh, tour food stops? Yeah. 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 Actually, but, but, you know, later when we ended up playing in Turing Machine too. That was that don't was like the a gun. real pitch blend. Well, occasionally, okay, pa- <laughs> occasionally <laughs> on pitch blend, tree ups didn't really eat. Pat was a vegetarian who didn't like food, so he wouldn't. He'd just kind of go off on his tree, own. Tree ups has my favorite um, ordering thing, where we would be at like Ben's Chili and Cheesesteak Restaurant, and he would order the salmon. Like he was that guy. <laughs> right. right. No, I was like, don't. Don't and then do like, it. Your salmon is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's a there's a kind of a hierarchy where. You're lucky if, if they buy you a pizza for the show. And then if, above that, you might get a buyout, like a $10 buyout. Right. So you'd get a $10 buyout, and you'd go kind of fan out around the neighborhood where the club was and yeah. see like what you could find. And generally, half uh, well, Pat, the vegetarian, would go off and buy a burrito. And we Scott and I would actually yeah. try to find a restaurant. And, and those those little things, like you know, when you're in a punk band and you're sleeping on floors, if you could just manage to scrape enough money to do something that you consider kind of civilized – during the day and right. like sit it's, in a restaurant and have somebody bring you food and relax and yeah. be like, this is going to be okay. And sit there and talk about how nobody's probably going to come to the show or whatever. But it like give that little period of time where you're not as anxious. We also, uh, there are a handful of times where we'd be stuck somewhere. Uh, we were in Olympia, Washington for a long, like maybe two or three days. And we made, we made like a Sunday sauce. Yeah. And that, that was that was great. It's fantastic. Right. We would Everybody cook at people's houses and like cook for them, and that was always just watch Sunrod documentaries all day. Exactly. And cook yeah, exactly. Sauces. exactly. We uh, actually, and one of my favorite memories was in Livingston, Montana, outside of uh, Bozeman or Missoula. I forget. Someone help me with Montana. Anyway, I think it was outside of Missoula. No, uh, it was outside of Bozeman, Bozeman, outside of Bozeman, which is great. We stayed with this guy, uh, John. God, what is his last name? Anyway, he he booked all the shows, and you stayed in his house. He's actually now a big deal uh, Hollywood sound designer, actually. But he, we stayed with him and. He left, but he left us elk steaks in a marinade, and we had elk steaks. And this, we, this great kind of w- 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 yeah, yeah, we this barbecued great whiskey elk steaks outside. chili marinade, and that was amazing. I, I, I would eat that. I would elk? eat that now. Oh, yeah. it was, yeah. it was, it was, it was great. incredible. So, like, that was sort of the and that was sort of the trajectory Scott and I got on around that time because we grew up in big food families, and we were traveling. And, you know, around, like, the third or fourth or whatever tour, we'd been to a lot of these places before, and it kind of became about, like... What else is there to yeah, do? Yeah, how in the can city? I make this more interesting? You end up seeing the Williamsburg, you know, of every single place you go to. You're on. You play. I'm if sorry. you're lucky, if you're lucky, you play the Bedford Avenue of every city. There's which is great. one. Right. If you're unlucky, <laughs> well, if you're unlucky, <laughs> you're not paying the Ainsley. And it's in Street. Virginia. Yeah. yeah, I remember colonial and classic. Uh, 
Darren, when you came, when I lived on Capitol Hill in Seattle, and he's like, "So where where are we gonna go hang out?" And I was like, "I'm living where we hang out." And then we did that, and then it's like, "That's it." Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, exactly. like, like, I was there it. for a weekend, and I was like, and by Sunday, I went. Well, I've seen it. Yeah, um, cool. Seattle. We Thank have a you. we have a very good Capitol Hill in Seattle uh, food story. We were in Seattle for a couple of days, and we stayed with this, uh, this guy Niels Bernstein, who oh, yeah. now oh, yeah. runs. Uh, that he's was a, like the, he was a publicist at Sub Pop then. Yeah, and now he's the and he always stayed with him. And we were there for a couple of days, and a, a friend of his had just been to Alaska, and I guess FedExed the salmon in or something. Yeah, his Ooh. friend was salmon fishing in Alaska, and FedExed him overnighted him like wild caught cold water Pacific salmon. Wow. And uh, they had this amazing salmon. Did you guys grill? I, I missed it because I went to go see a college friend, and uh, that was not fun. <laughs> we, but I, I missed the the whole thing, and I missed uh, a Drew Barrymore show Drew Barrymore back show in the day, yes. back back around when she was dating the guy in the hole. And then we all went to a drag show. Oh yes, the drag Wait, show. Drew but, Barrymore <laughs> show. No, no, no a drag show. Drag show. Oh, so let's. So we're let's, on your show. Pay attention. Yeah. Oh, so, so yeah. I, I, Wait, I just, were you, <laughs> Darren heard wild caught salmon. He's like, now I would get like some lemon. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what we did. We steamed lemon in the oven. Let's talk about the decline of pitch blend. When did you know that the, your time as a four piece and as, was over? Uh, and what we, was the end game like? We had a really miserable t- last tour where uh, Justin and a couple other guys in the band got a ton of stuff stolen, and then about which, which number tour was this? Uh, like f- three or four, four or five. Was it like a one? We night? did weekend shows every we weekend up and down the East Coast, so like we would be in Boston and Philly and and Richmond, Bo- you know, <laughs> Richmond. Like we were always like around. Up yeah. in lots of college shows, but then we'd go on like full tours like yeah. once a year. Yeah, this is one of those like two month tours, and we got a bunch of stuff ripped off in San Francisco, which is why I still can't love San Francisco. Um, and then about the food scene is like, don't uh, judge us. I know. And about two and a half <laughs> weeks later, we thought we had kind of recovered, and then uh, I got the crap beat out of me in Albuquerque, and we had some more stuff stolen. What? And by then, we were just okay. It was just kind of all of our clothes just, got just stolen after silent. Scott, Scott got back. beaten up outside the band by like some like cholo dudes, hoping that they do a lot better than five luggages full of thrift <laughs> store clothes and dickies. <laughs> but we, that's we what they got. Yeah. These uh, these uh, skinny nerdy dudes look like they got a lot of Louis Vuitton going on. Yeah. Exactly. So. Um, so yeah, we got back and you know, you blanket on the band. Uh, no, I think yeah, we, we were all just, just, we just kind of ready. We're getting I mean, older. Like, like we were playing more, and there were diminishing returns and. And it was like, you know, we had traveled enough, too, to be like, wow, D.C. sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get out of D.C. Like, like, wow. we're, so in this, ba- we're in this town, and it's midnight, and there are five or six different places where you can get food. Right. So, yeah. so the band breaks up, ends, and you guys look towards Brooklyn, New York? I was thinking of Chicago or New York and the woman I was dating at the time. Girl, I guess at the time uh, <laughs> oh! uh, we were young. We were young. That's you were what young. I mean. I, didn't you um, say you were getting older? How old were you at this time? It's twenty four. Oh, yeah, getting, getting older. Yeah. We we're getting older. Yeah. So and and um, I was looking at Chicago, and she got a job here, and then I moved here, and it ended up being a great decision. I'm really glad. What, I what year is this? I'd probably be playing jazz. Uh, <laughs> this is ninety four. Okay. Uh, and I moved uh, a couple months later. I moved actually, weirdly enough, uh, March of ninety five to the third stop on the L train in Graham Avenue, and. Uh, what was that like? It was uh, there was the let me see there was my landlord who was uh, who was the cop who'd been kind of done something and he got demoted to being a peace officer and uh, made very unfunny racist jokes to me all the time. Told me how I could as get, opposed to the very funny. Yes, <laughs> of very big distinction. Like, yeah, here. The very Louis C.K. racist jokes that we've grown those are told. hilarious. He was not in in that. Uh, told me how I could get my car off the insurance rolls if uh, if I wanted to go out to New Jersey and that his son would help me. Um, and there was the White Castle, and that was pretty much it. I remember coming out to see Scott when I because I lived in Manhattan at the time. Because you could do that. Then. Where'd you live? I lived on Twenty Seventh and Third in a neighborhood that my friends was so bland and so white. My friends referred to it as Little Pittsburgh. <laughs> who, uh, who, who's, and, whose mom lived in your building? Yeah, yeah. Barry Manilow's mom lived in my building. Uh, it had, not much. As, I mean, yeah. as Murray Hill got much better. I had I had a one bedroom with a doorman and a washer and dryer for twelve hundred bucks a month that was rent stabilized. I would visit and him that and, was and the think most that he lived in the Jefferson apartment. apartment. I looked at in Manhattan at the time so it was a different era but Scott lived out here and I remember coming out and I felt like I was going to the middle of nowhere and now I work four stops past that so what so, and, and what jobs did you guys have at the time uh, I worked I got a temp job back then you know you, there, were, there was just tons of jobs and so I like, got a temp job the first day Thank I moved here me. and they offered me a job that day that I tempt. and so I ended up working for five years at a health insurance company doing like weird shit and Scott? Um, I didn't have a job. I was uh, unemployed, and there was a moment where I'd 
four hundred dollars left, and just trying to figure out. Well, I guess I can move back to Maine and live with my parents. Uh, actually, they were divorced. Live with a parent. Um, so I spent my days. Uh, my roommate and I. We figured out that people wouldn't give us any shit if we walked around like everyone else did the neighborhood. So we walked around literally shirtless, wearing jeans, drinking Rolling Rock in our neighborhood for maybe a couple of weeks. And then I got a call from John Fine, a friend of mine who was working in journalism, and he needed help on a project that eventually became Time Out New York, actually. Um, and so I did that and thought I had it made because I had a, you know, I think they paid me like $100 a day, and it was like, it was all great. Did you get tan? Uh, I did, I got tan. It was good. Um, and so then where was the, you know, it's like, hey, like, we should do another, a, another project. Um, I was living in the same John Fine. Yeah. What year is this? 1996. John Fine of... Which John band? Fine of Bitch Magnet and Vineland and, uh, and Coptic Light. Coptic Light, yes. Uh, soon to be releasing a new memoir on the indie rock experience. Yes. Yes. Um, Where we both make cameos. Yes, exactly. With cameo. Hey, did shirts yeah. on? Shirts, shirts off? on. Did, shirts he ma- on. did he make Sh- you look shirts cool? Shirts off. Um, no, it did not. Um, anyway, so John lived in a big a loft building on, uh, on Roebling and South 2nd. Big, big building, I think. And they, Roebling and South Second yeah. in 1995 was terrifying. A dollar a square foot. They had an 1,800-square-foot space. They paid $1,800, and there were four of them. Um, there was a studio in half of it, and I was in between places because I'd moved out of my, uh, my racist landlord's house and lived in the studio and kept my sleeping bag in the bass drum. Um, and during that time, Justin started coming in to book them more often, and then the drummer of John's band, Vineland, we kind of got along with, and had, we liked the same kind of music, so we just started playing. And uh, I don't know exactly know what happened, but at a certain point, we had a handful of songs. Yeah, and we had we like did a whole, we did this thing where we played. It was me, Scott, and Jerry Fuchs, and we did this thing where we played for three years, and we never played a show because we were convinced that we were going to get a singer because nobody <laughs> wanted to hear an instrumental band. And so we we went through like a handful of friends and strangers, and it always sucked. And then one day we were just like, "Oh wait, I I, I think we're a band. Like I think we actually." Like we can just do this. These songs are pretty sweet. Like let's just stick. Let's just be an instrumental band. And I mean, it, l- we can't have less people like us than like Pitch Blend. So <laughs> why, why don't which we hear is an, true, by the way. Why yeah. don't we hear an early, uh, an early one? An early one. Um, and, and what year sure. was this? This is ninety six. Ninety six. I think the earliest one of the earliest songs we wrote on the first record. Hmm. I will play. What should I play? I don't know. Go for it. Uh, let's play a song called Got My Rock Pants On. How's that?
And it goes. And it goes. We didn't write a lot of short songs. I mean... Sorry about that. I, I have to say, it's, for any of you fans, like, just uh, dive into Spotify if you have it. Like, I spent this weekend listening to all of your, oh, all of your records. Fun. Well, my first, my first memory... ching <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah what, what, do you get, what are you getting on? Uh, I think those? you get .01 cents. Yeah. Uh, so you guys made money by coming on here is what I'm trying to say. So so did, my, I'm not going back to work. My first... Uh, I just hell with it. My first memory <laughs> of you is that... Um, I did college radio, um, and I used to have the 8 a.m. Friday show. So uh, I would, you know, go out drinking all night Thursday, and then you know, like go to bed for a couple hours, get up, go to the radio station, and on the days that just the hangover was more just like. So still you did do, uh, drive time. Uh, 8 a.m. <laughs> 8 a.m. Drive time, Eugene, Oregon. I think that's like a lot of people on bikes. Yeah. Um, I would just try and find records that had like the longest possible songs, so I could play them, <laughs> and then sleep. So and we are the stranglehold of uh, indie yeah. Rock, so it was like the live built the spill album, um, a couple like oh, just play Cortez the Killer, yeah, like Rod- <laughs> like Rodan records, and then your guys' records. Uh, so I would put your guys' records on and just kind of like put my head down on the counter, and uh, that happens how I, a lot. By the that's way, yeah. How, yeah, exactly. And that's that's how, the general oh. reaction. To our music. <laughs> the toy machine album, <laughs> thump. But anyway, that was like the first, and I was like, oh, this band is this band is great. Oh, and I, then I went to sleep. And so. I, uh, I first <laughs> Again, saw you guys yeah. at uh, 4040 in Philadelphia. Yeah. Our five production show. And Shout out to Sean Agnew. Sean yeah. Agnew walked by me afterwards and was like, wasn't that the sickest fucking thing you've ever seen? So, so <laughs> and I, and Sean I went, was a big supporter. And then, when, and then all I went was, <gasps> Sean Agnew just talked to me. Oh. In, my, in my mind, just with Sean Agnew, I mean, he's only a few years older than us, but to us, because just the, the way that it works, Sean Agnew is like a giant in our mind and like could potentially, is like, because he started so young, mm-hmm. even though he would, did so much stuff, he's so young, he might as well be like 50 in my mind. He's been doing so much uh, he's stuff. He's an incredible success from, from DIY too. So and they're if actually anybody really has, inspiring, dude. Yeah. And we cruise, we were on the Coachella cruise together. Yeah. So, uh, so '96, um, the band is you know we just started. You just uh, started. What, the, what's the first food? record? Kind of was recorded in '99, so it took us a little. Okay. Yeah. So, what's the food landscape for you guys at that oh. time? <laughs> a lot of uh, cheap food. Um, I'm, yeah, I think we were both. We weren't really making a ton of cash, but we were eating a lot of Chinatown. I would w- I would walk in over the the crumbling Williamsburg Bridge at that time, and we'd meet up and we'd get Vietnamese food a lot. We had a lot of pho. We called it pho back then. I guess now we have to say pho. Now we say pho. Oh. Um, and we literally we'd go to the same place. Uh, I was just saying before. Was it pho, was that pho de train? We would go to pho pasteur. Pho pasteur. And that's it. pho I mean, new pasteur. Yeah, I went maybe 40, 40 weekends out of out of one year. Forty yeah, times. Forty. Fairly certain. <laughs> you go in, same guy working, no glimmer of recognition. Yeah, I see the same people. I go to pho bang with my wife all the time, and. Same guy waits on us every single time for ten years. We know what they say about white people. Nothing. All the same. That's true. That's they, funny. And they racist, just, or, and they, by just the way. Or, they all just, just order number eight. They all <laughs> order true. number eight. What was number eight? four? Uh, it's the phone with brisket. With, can I get that with no tripe, please? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and now you're like the more tripe the merrier. Uh, I'm a, but, back, but yeah, back then like we would there was we'd go out to Queens to like you know we heard that there's a Brazilian restaurant or whatever. It was all ethnic food yeah, because that was the cheapest way to eat too. You'd go to Jackson Heights to eat Indian. You'd go. You, you, you know, you the, spent a lot of time the, the, trying there was, to find there was the, the rumor, cheap eats. The rumor of the barbecue place in Queens that had real barbecue. This is before barbecue blew up. Was we, that at the car auto, auto park? Um, I don't know. We just drove. We went to a couple of places, and one time it was closed. And yeah. It was that sort of thing. Like, someone yeah. always had a car, and we would always you try to You'd hear about a burger place. Places. You'd go out to the burger place in the back of a sports bar or whatever. Like, it was, more, it was, it was always about cheap food. Like, the idea of dining, like, the idea of eating in a restaurant in the 90s for us that had Two numbers and the price of the food was out. Yeah. Right, like you know, if it was uh, if it was over nine ninety nine, there was a place called a uh, Soto Cinque on Third uh, Avenue, which was pasta under five, under five, and like you'd, <laughs> we'd go there, you know, like. But I'm, but I'm, we tried to find the best food we could for what we could afford. We were still really for even being broke, we were incredibly picky. Yes, <laughs> snobby picky. Is, isn't yeah. isn't that what any rock is? Yes. Of course, yes. I'm broke, but I'm very picky. Oh, yeah. is that the floor I'm sleeping on? <laughs> uh, is there, oh, not is this, there a cat here? Not oh. this oh. Sun, Not this Sunrod documentary. I've <laughs> seen this one. Uh, I get it. He's from outer space. I know. <laughs> I know. So uh, And so you guys start touring, right? 
And uh, you see, uh, no, we never. No. That's the thing. Machine was never really. Turing a machine was program. actually ironically named because we never toured. Uh, really, more than I think we. And did, everybody thought we, we were called days. Touring Machine, yes. and then we'd have to explain well, yeah. our way out of that. So oh, yeah, that yeah, probably yeah, wasn't a nerdy we conversation at all. No, it? no, and it usually was with women. No, yes. it was not with women. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So no. you didn't learn the lesson from Pitch Blend with an E. Like, we'll call it Turing Machine, and we won't have a singer. Yeah, we won't have a singer. Well, at least you couldn't alienate women with gold. With what? You couldn't alienate them with just math rock. That's true. That's true. But, so um, things did change, but things have very much changed. I mean, at this point, we're playing, and the audiences are they're pretty 50-50. 50-50 right? now, Well, because yeah. now you're yeah. playing with that sweet disco sound. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Sweet disco sound, yes. So 99 first record comes out. What's it, what label is it on? J-Tree. Love Jade Tree, and that was the that was that, that was, was like the, the golden years of Jade Tree. Ninety nine, like Brazil us, was on that record. Prom, on our that. first show was with the Promise Ring. Like they called us, and they're like, I, "I knew those guys," and they're like, "Come on, stop playing in a practice space. Play a real show." So we went and played with them at some college. At Bard, Bard, at Bard. Yes. Oh, we well, oh. had a good chance up there. Uh, well, Smith and all those, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yes, I was expecting well, the, well, a lot. You know, when you play with the promise ring, pretty much that's for all the attention from from the girls. That's true. I was expecting a lot of black turtlenecks and smoking, but apparently that hasn't been like that for a while. Oh, man, but Ham- uh, that part of uh, that was in New Hampshire. No, uh, it's upstate New York. Upstate, upstate New York. Too. Upstate New York. Tivoli, but but so yeah, so so we ended up playing with like all the J- with Jets to Brazil, like we we and like we did a small amount of like regional touring with all those bands because they were friends. Joan of Arc. We essentially, oh, we man. essentially yeah. went out to uh, Minnesota and back. Yeah. And it was great. Yeah, and then we, awesome. we did that two times? Yeah. And, wh- and what was the reason that kept you guys from being all, uh, on the road? We were or, all employed. No employed, yeah. And uh, we were all like, there's no way I'm going to like Jerry worked in the stock again. market. Our yeah, Jer- Jerry worked in the stock market. market for a while. And then like, kind of bounced around and like, ended up working at Scholastic for a long time. And we just, um, we really didn't ever want to compromise being employed. Especially living in New York. It's yeah. scary, you know? Right. Yeah. Still so scary. you were at timeout, and then you were. Just I wasn't. It was never timeout. Oh. I ended up. Uh, that was a project that fell through. Fell through, and I ended up uh, weirdly helping start ESPN magazine. Okay. Um, and yeah. then uh, after that, I went to work to VH1 and wrote TV specials for them. What Which, were some of your specials? Oh, where are they now? Is a big one that I wrote. Oh, I will Which say, is kind of like what this show is about. But <laughs> oh. oh, we're right here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's not an insult. Oh, right. I never is is that an insult? No, no. Okay. Not at all. Uh, what was your favorite? Where are they now? Uh, my favorite. Where are they now? Was when we got the guys from the Vapors back together for the first time to talk, and they sat down in London and they hadn't really spoken since the day they broke up, and they still hated each other, and they got in a big fight. And you guys don't even know who the Vapors are, so no. that's the best. Uh, you know turning Japanese. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Um, um, and now they make shows like that. They make yeah, shows. Where now they, they make just, exactly. We should, like, we should have just made an entire show. Out of that genre instead. They did. They made that... Sh- that Bands Reunited. Bands Reunited. Reunited. These guys were not... It was two of the guys that were super successful. One guy was a lawyer. One guy was like some other entrepreneur. And the other guys, you could tell, were just like, I can't believe you ruined my life by kicking me out of this band. And we're going to get you all together for a big <laughs> special on VH1. Exactly. So, so then well. kind of take us through the next few years. The record, first record comes out in 99. You're touring a little bit. Playing, playing here and there on the we weekends. We played a lot in New York. We played like, you know, we were, we were selling out brownies and yeah. stuff like that. And played brownies uh, last great. show yeah. as a cover band, which was kind of fun. What was the cover band? The uh, very, very last night of brownies, like everybody that, that had ever played there got up on stage and did covers. Ted Leo did a, yeah. uh, did a set. We did a set. Radio 4 did stuff. and It was super fun. Like sort of the house favorite bands. Ted Leo, did he play for three hours? No, but he did do Bob O'Reilly. And, and my Ooh. studio stage dove at the end of it, which was really ep- ep- epic. That's true. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> what did you play? We uh, did, put a Minor Threat song with John Fine singing. We did a Mission of Burma, Mission song. Burma song. We did a Killing Joke song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think we did uh, Me I Disconnect From You by and, Gary Newman. And, and I think then we a, did a No Joy Love Division Lost song. by Joy Division. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. those were the only covers I know, so I know <laughs> that's what we did. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I know five cover songs. We used to actually, it's funny, with Turing Machine, up until you know maybe 2005 or so, we'd always end the show with a cover where we'd sing because we... In a way, because we felt bad, we made people listen for uh-huh. forty minutes yeah. of instrumental music. Yeah. So that was always kind of fun. apologetic. It's, it's like a really sad. Sorry about cover. that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, guys. Here's but during song that you time, know. the late '90s or 2000s, there, I mean, Don Cab and a whole litany no, of other bands. Toward, that's what, actually, like, those are bands I, that we played a I lot. Mean, with I went to a lot of show, Tristeza. Like I would go see yeah. bands. We played with them too. There was no. Lyrics. Believe me, if there was a band that yes. didn't have a singer, we got the call to we play. I mean, did you fully embrace math rock as a title, or did you? I think we always wanted to play with bands that didn't sound like us. Yeah, and our whole thing is like we really always, and that's it shows like the way we ended made the last the final record is we were really always trying to be sort of dance musicy, 
or dance music related, even though at that point I didn't listen to any dance music, but I had seen a lot of car commercials. So I figured it kind of had a general idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's a general idea of what, what it was, but, but I mean, we really were sort of into that, that kind of concept. I mean, it would just, it was more like we want to do something more funky and groovy. And you did that with Panthers, right? Yes, exactly. So, but let's, let's, <laughs> let's do early 2000s. Uh, 2000s, we actually started writing some more songs, and then we recorded a second record called Zwei, which means, I believe, two in, in German. German. Um, and recorded a record with Steve Revit, who is a good friend of ours, who ran Front of House Sound for LCD Sound System, and recorded a bunch of other bands that are bigger than us. Um, and that came out on French Kiss Records. Ooh, which what up, Sid? Exciting, uh, I said. Uh, have you found our masters yet? Because no one seems to be able to find them. Yeah. Uh, no, it's true. Ooh. They've gone missing. Uh, it's it, very, it's very up, Eddie and the Cruisers, if you saw that movie. They're going to show up uh, in a box in 20 years. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. you'll re-release your second album. <laughs> that yeah. sounds perfect. Um, so we recorded that and then went on a little bit of a tour, went down. Uh, did we do South by Southwest that year? Uh, that might, yeah, because I was in Panthers then, too. And so we did a double tour where, like, both bands were in the same van, and I played both shows each night, which was actually really fun. And, uh, but the, the tour was whatever. We went South by Southwest and back, and that was, we had a great time. Yeah. But, um, speaking of, speaking of dance rock, um, mm-hmm. that Panthers Thank Me Both Hands Mastercraft remix was one of the first, like, dance that's, rock. That thing yeah. was huge. That, and I remember yeah. that came out, and yeah. that's when, like, you could actually collect all the dance rock. So yeah. songs and it was like yeah. that like and the cards. House of Jealous Lovers, House of Jealous, like uh, Phones, uh, Block Party Remix. Yeah. And I remember Losing trying to find edge. out like m- like Massacre, but who are these guys? And they had like they just had like this weird photo up on their website and like it was like really cryptic. And I was like, huh? And we played that at all of our dance nights. When and I then you found out it was the dude from Death from Above seventy nine. Uh, we were just not that yeah. savvy at the internet. Yeah. It, gotcha. it took it took us it took us a while, yeah. but uh, but that was like one of the yeah. first. So. Well, uh, yeah. you'll be happy to know that there's a Turing Machine remix, uh, Double 12, in the works. That's true. Which we're excited about. Hot, so. Chip, Hot Chip remix, uh, Steve Moore remix, uh, House of House remix. And a DJ McNanny remix. And a remix. DJ McNanny remix. Wait, that sounds, that sounds amazing. Who's putting that out? Kind of uh, temporary Residence. Yeah. We're just waiting. We're waiting on a longer version of the Hot Chip remix. So... <laughs> Long intros and outros for those DJs. Yeah. Exactly. Totally. Uh, so you look like you're ready to, to play another song. No, I, another I song. can play a song off the second record. Yeah, let's hear a song off the second record. album. Then, uh, then I'll we'll play a little uh, bit, and then we'll go right to the. We'll bring it to the future. The new record, the future. Yeah. All right, here we go. This is a bit of a fade in. Oh yeah, look at that. Wow, that changes everything. By the way.
I can uh, I can see where the funkiness is yeah, already creeping know. in. Yeah. yeah. So uh, around this time, you uh, what you, year is this? Now where are we? I have no idea. So, so you've record, record, uh, record came out in two thousand four. So and you've you're, toured, and yet Justin, you're getting into wine about this time, right? Yeah. Um, our someone we're all friends with, Jay Strell. Love uh, Jay Strell. Jay Strell, is, Jay Strell was, the was great the connector. First, when when he lived, when he he actually lived in a group house with Scott and I in DC, and he was really and into Dave beer. Tutorials. He was yeah, he was really into beer. And he had a these uh, Michael Jackson the Beer Hunter videos that I would watch that blew my mind because I got into the whole idea that it was travel related, not Michael Jackson. There's a there was a, a, a white British, Michael Jackson. <laughs> British, uh, British don't beer you mean expert. two white Michael Jackson? <laughs> exactly. So so he had these, and I got into that idea and like that beer was like regionally specific and it was even though we could only afford Milwaukee's best or whatever at the time. But we would occasionally go to the the Brick Skeller, which had a like thirty page beer book. And yeah, we get really excited because we all ordered a five dollar beer, and. Uh, and then um, I moved to New York, and Jay ended up moving here later. And we would like spend the days walking around and you know hanging out because that's what you did then. You walk shirts on solo. or shirts off? Shirts. Oh, we were shirts on. Okay. So, but Jay would always go to Astor Wines or wine shops, and and I sort of by hanging out with him, I was like, oh, I can actually afford wine. I didn't know it could be cheap. And 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 around then, you know, there were you know we were still broke and young, so we were drinking like five dollar bottles of wine, but they were actually made by people. And then Jay ended up getting a job years later. Uh, he was thinking about opening a wine shop, actually, and just never really found the right space. And ended up working at Uva Wines and when it was on North 5th Street in Williamsburg. And it was like, you should work here one day a week. And I kind of bluffed my way into the job and started working there and got really interested in wine. And what year is this? I got, what was it, 03? Okay. 04, really- 04 maybe, yeah. 04. And yeah, probably 04. And then... Um, and then... Little by little, like a year and a half later, I, I, I really got so into it that I became the buyer there when the buyer left. I remember and, you, you yeah. were telling me you were super excited about the the, the Wine Avenger book. The uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. There was a book by this guy, Willie Gluckstern, called The Wine Avenger that I got really into. And, and it was like, you know, it was about, like, don't ever spend more than $10 on a bottle of wine. And they're swearing in it and all the shit. And I got really psyched on that. And so I used to go into the city then when I got really serious. And I'd go in the city and buy wine and bring it back to Brooklyn because there weren't wine shops out here. and I don't know. It was just so. And did you? How quickly did you become known as the wine guy of your friends? Uh, a couple of years, maybe. I don't Pretty know. Quickly, yeah. Jay, Jay was kind of the wine guy for a long time, and then, and then I found sort of my niche, which was natural wines and stuff like that, which is sort of the the indie rock world version version of wine. So, do you find that a lot of your indie rock tendencies just moved over to food? I think it's all. It's all. It's not just indie rock because every, every, every all that little picky shit. Is just you know, there's music like that, there's food like that, there's clothes. There's I know people that are really into to wine that are really into fashion or, or book collecting too that don't care about indie rock. It's just like they're all similar obsessions. Doesn't care about indie I rock. No, it's sad. It's weird. Uh, yeah. She sounds female. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then Scott, how did you make your way into From ESPN magazine to it was the uh, it was the culmination of fit, essentially fifteen years of uh, doing a lot of freelance food writing for some awesome publications and some less awesome publications. Um, I essentially needed money and knew a guy who edited the Farmer's Guide to New York. Remember those when they came out every year, big mm-hmm. bound books. Yeah. And I edited the edited the dining restaurant section for two years even though I had just moved to New York and didn't know anywhere to go and that was you're like I heard there's a barbecue place like, out in Queens now it was a <laughs> lot of it open. was a lot of phone calls to Le Cirque asking them to send me menus and tell me about their specials and then I'd write up a 30 word blurb about it and then Sparrow's if you're looking for New York's best pizza that was Sparrow's was not in there <laughs> we tended to keep the chain restaurants out but there were three levels of expense and uh, yeah we never really had money to send me anywhere and then I wrote a few things for a time out where my now actually boss, uh, editor in chief Adam Rappaport, oh, yeah. was the food guy back in the back for time out. And I wrote one piece that he really liked, which was essentially living in New York on five dollars a day food wise, which is all about cooking out all your meals, eating leftovers. It was a week. I fudged it a teeny bit, but not that much. And what was uh, the fudging? I didn't actually eat the chicken salad the next day from the from the roast chicken and a lot of that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. Oh, you could have. You could have. Yeah. You could have. I see um, that you've been holding that guilt for years. I did. We didn't even probe that. you, and you're yeah. like, I just, I got to clean. Uh, and then he went to GQ, and I wrote a piece for him where I went upstate and killed a chicken. This is pre everyone with killing, his bare hands, everyone killing things. Snap uh, the neck. I was with the early. Neck. No, it was a. Uh, it was actually uh, an axe, which I since found out is less efficient, and uh, you should actually just cut the vein and bleed them out which is actually much more brutal. I've done that, too. That's not fun. 
but the axe is just uh you know, anyway so i did that and i uh, was always doing freelance food stuff on the side and then uh eventually got back in touch with adam when he got this job and sent him way too many memos and i think he just gave up and said all right please enough of the memos come on board so, and what year is that? That was uh, when they moved Bon App from uh, L.A. to New York. They essentially got rid of the entire staff and restaffed up in New York. And so that was 2011, January. So Turing Machine second record came out when? 2004. So what happened in the interim between? I mean, obviously, you guys got jobs and everything. Greg. I'm on... <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, can we not talk? A lot yeah, happened. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course. Well, yeah, we'll get, well our, uh, at this point, our, our our drummer Jerry was playing a lot of other bands. He was in Chick Chick Chick. He filled in and uh, for, LCD, for LCD, played for the, the Massive tour. Attack record. Like, he was doing a lot. He was really of, becoming he was the guy. A real drummer, a real musician. Like unlike us, he was like a guy who would have be- been a professional musician for his life. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, and so. We didn't play a whole lot. We would kind of get together and play a bit and get some steam momentum, and then he'd go away again. So in 2008, we... 2008, we went upstate? That sounds right. Yeah, we went up... We, I've just kind of falling down house upstate. So we went up there for a long weekend of food and essentially recording a, a bunch of demos. And our friend DJ came up. Our friend Mike, friend Mike came up. And we just like cooked and, and drank and, and played. And played we, we went through nonstop. How many we never cases, did that before. How many cases of wine did we We did like three cases yeah. in two days. Amateur. We Amateur hour. We essentially <laughs> played and drank all weekend and came away with a lot of really good stuff and then listened to it, got excited about it. Then it kind of sat because Jerry went away and played. And we uh, tried to replay it and it never had the same vibe because they were all improvs. Yeah. And we couldn't really relearn it. And then we never really had the momentum. And then we started playing a bit, and we had a couple of really good practices. And then, uh, you know, and then the, about a year and a half later, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, people listening, um, our drummer died in a horrible, horrible accident. And obviously, the band was put on hold, and it bummed everybody out, as well as you might imagine it would when one of your best friends passes away. Um, I had to bring the radio show down um so this is i mean i only bring it up because it is part of your guys yeah of course we're not gonna not talk yeah. about it yeah. of course um but you know we uh, so we got talking and, and we thought what the hell let's let's see if, let's see if we can finish this record and we, we have, really a, wanted a lot of like, people you know, were was, asking a lot of us about our friends it. were like come on you guys like you have all this stuff recorded don't don't pussy out on this like, oh, hold on i heard a really great story wasn't there a story about I'd like to hear the story. He was well, still listening to the CDs. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. When we, yeah, we were. One of the gruesome things that happens when a friend dies is if you're an adult, you know, yes, friends come in and you clean out his room and call the family. And we were cleaning things up, and in, on his in his CD player was the CD of the demos. So he'd been listening to the demos, which is great. And we and had a, one of the last time we the last time we hung out, we yeah. were really talking about like. Dude, let's just finish this. So we, you know, we ended up going back. We had very generous friends. Our friend Jeremy at Temporary Residence, our friend Andrew Raposo, and yeah, uh, sure. then our future soon-to-be friend Abe Seaforth. They really got with us, and they were like, "Let's finish this record." This There's is a lot be of stuff awesome. here. You guys can do it. Yeah, and Justin and, and I didn't know. We kind of yeah. We it's really, a new way of making records for us. It was yeah. We didn't really know how to make records on the computer and edit and all that stuff. We just used to go in and play live and and make it, but. There was enough there that we really were able to edit it and make it into a record, and it was. And the records. I still think the it's the best it, thing we ever did. It is amazing. So. And I just want to say that when we got it to, I mean, I'd never seen you guys growing up because no one ever came to Eugene. Right. Uh, when I was <laughs> at least when pitch I was living there. Pitch blend did. That's true. Yeah. Okay, pitch blend. There's a way to make gas money on yeah. the way to San Francisco. Pretty yeah. much, or you know, <laughs> south, <laughs> south of uh, Portland. But when I saw you guys play at Union Paul, I was like, "Holy shit, these guys are fucking amazing." And like at, when you played that Union Pool show, which is still one of my favorite venues to, sh- to see bands. Yeah, yeah so so we ended up we ended up playing some shows for fun. We got a fr- our friend Chris Egan to play drums, yeah. who's now on tour probably for the rest of his life with Solange Knowles. Yeah, so you, and, you guys are really yeah. gifted at finding gifted drummers. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, now, so. also yeah. finding drummers who we work well personality wise. And Chris, yeah, so Chris, so Chris was a that was, a, that was another thing, another reason. And when why did you I, happen to find Chris? He worked at the wine <laughs> shop with me. Yeah. At, 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 at uh, one point, we were rehearsing for our first show with a new band because we added two people after this record, and three of the five people in the band actually worked at Uva. I remember yeah. when you guys. It played. was really hard to practice because we had to figure <laughs> out a time where everybody couldn't be at work. Right. It's like yeah. you guys. I think there was one show you played where like Uva just shut down for the afternoon yeah. because it was yeah. just. He had to run back oh, to yeah. work after yeah. after a show outside. Yeah. But so so that's fun. And we do that more for like events and 
party shit, yeah. you know, like. Yeah. Do want, should I play a song? Yeah, let's play a song. No, because we'll no, go no, out let's with finish it. up. Yeah, yeah, we'll finish up. We'll finish okay. out with it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so what's what's on the future for you guys, both food and musically? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm really into the important wine importing thing right now. And uh, just got back from three weeks in France. We signed somewhere between seven and nine new producers. This new, la- this new, this new bands has got some hot stuff coming out of Yeah, exactly. So that's been great. And I uh, mean, is that what it's like, though, when you're signing a it's new a wine little, guy? It's a little like that, but it's not. But bands like are somebody that's existed for a year. Like we're talking, I'm talking about people that have made things for a long period of time that like work, you know, farmers. Like being in a band is easy. Being a farmer is no joke. Can you just give us a quick rundown of what it's like to find a new wine and sign them? Uh, it depends. It's both, but mostly you know, it's personality. Like you go, you taste, you hang out. Hopefully it's good. A lot of the time it's not. You find something you really want, and then you have a conversation about who else you work with. And it is sort of, you know, in a label way, it is that kind of thing where, like, once once you mention people that they respect that you work with, then they trust you. But, you know, a couple of American dudes just rolling up to some farmer's house, you know, to taste and hang out. They can be suspicious until you show who your references are. And then um, you taste, you hang out, you go to the vines, you... You spend time together, you eat together, you develop a real relationship, and then when they trust you, they put a bunch of wine in a truck and it shows up in New York, you know, and, and we sell it to restaurants and shops. And what's your favorite new wine? I, I don't really have a favorite. You love them all. No, I just, I just, what do I you mean, love? I really like, I like our book and I like our portfolio and I'm really excited about what we're doing overall. And I think it's it's really amazing I'll, to see it all as, as one big package. I'll ask it another way. My parents, their wedding anniversary, mm-hmm. thirty four years. What would you? What type of bottle would you recommend from your book for them for thirty four years? I don't know. I don't know their parents. I'd have to know what they drank. You know. I mean, that's the thing. It's so like so democratic. A, <laughs> it is. It's you know. It's 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 about the time and the place. It's not like it's not like a cachet thing. We're like, oh, this will, you know, this is going to make you happy. I think you know, I have, we have things that I think are really epic and beautiful, but. Uh, although you didn't know, that is actually the correct answer. Okay. Well done. Okay. And All if right. people people want to find out where to get your wine, where could they go? Uh, well, we're working on a website. We don't have one, so uh, we will have a website in the next, I'd say, month. We'll finally we'll have a real website up. It's it'll just be zevrovineselections dot com or no, it's, Z, it's I think it's zevrovineselections dot com or zrs wines dot com. I can't remember. Say that. What a little. How do you spell that? Zrswines dot com okay. or it's zevrovineselections dot com. That's my friend Zev's name. He had the company long before uh, we started working together, and I've helped him sort of develop a lot of the stuff he's done the last few years, and we're having a blast. Awesome, Thanks. Scott. What do you got coming up? Uh, I actually got a little bit of traveling coming up, which is good because normally I am desk bound. Um, I'm going to – where am I going? I'm going to Maine for a little story. I should be going going to London. Uh, quickly, London, we did a uh, – we got asked to play uh, All Tomorrow's Parties. Uh, oh, yeah. We, we went food And essentially tour. Justin and I just set it up with our friend Nancy. The Essentially, the show was the smallest part of it. Oh, the show was fantastic, but we set up food all around it. We, we did a DJ night the day after the show. In London, so we could actually spend an extra day eating. We ate with the the uh, dudes from the Young Turks, Isaac and uh, shout out and Daniel, yep, Daniel so and, uh, and Johnny. Uh, we yeah. ate upstairs at Ten Bells, and they served us the menu they were working on for uh, the new restaurant Shoreditch uh, Clove Club, which really just good opened reviews. up. Oh, it was so awesome! That was one of the best meals I had last really year. And uh, so that was. We had a really great food experience in London, but uh, where else am I going? Oh, I'm excited about Mexico City. Uh, oh yeah, Mesa America. That should be a blast. I'm really. I've never been. I have a good friend of mine who goes like once every six weeks, so I'm excited about that. That's awesome. I think the last Swallow issue, Swallow Magazine, is all about Mexico City. It's a scratchy sniff, so you should check it out. I don't know if I want to check that out, really. Um, And then Turing Machine? Um, We're we're looking for our first show in 2013. Uh, It's hard to get. I mean, there are five grown men, and uh, three of the other guys have very, very serious musical things they do. And so it's really hard to get us in a room. Yeah, we're hoping to do something interesting in the end of June, early July. Oh my God, that'd be a great name for your next album: Five Grown Men in a Room. <laughs> uh, but we'll talk. It'd be interesting know. googling that. So yeah. That uh, um, Wait but, a minute. Well, uh, we'll figure it out. Maybe we'll get you guys to uh, DJ the barbecue series. Cool. Oh, we did that last year. That was We'll do that with Garrett and May and something like cool. that. Great. Um, well, I want to thank everybody here at Heritage: uh, Jack, Aaron, Patrick, Joe, all the interns, Rec Tech. Rec tech. All the people eating in front of us. All the behind, people thinking behind us. Behind the window. The people at Roberta's. Um, Mom, Dad, Joe. Happy anniversary. Brilliant Happy anniversary. 
150 episodes. Greg. 150, uh, congratulations wow. on 150 episodes. Pretty awesome. That's some real stick to itiveness. <laughs> really, <laughs> I could true. never do something like That's that. That's why I was kicked out of Gifted and Talented when I was a kid because I didn't have stick to itiveness. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You didn't get a, you, you got a wink and not a smiley face. Essentially, yeah. Um, awesome. And, you know, hopefully in a year we'll be doing 200. And uh, this summer we got a lot of good things. What, what's the smirk? No, I'm just thinking about. <laughs> oh next my god, you're gonna quit already, aren't you? Yeah. No, no. So all this has really been great. My last show. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and you know, thanks to my job for letting me to come. Thanks to all Monday. of our jobs <laughs> for letting us come. And uh, if you've missed any of the 150 episodes, which I can't imagine why you would have, they're all up for the archive on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Please become a member. Support us. We are at the mercy of membership drives. It's true. It's um, true. I have one more song to play. Should I play the one with vocals or the one that's kind of a crut rocky jam? Which which one do you think best represents the future of Turing Machine? Machine. Play, play the crut rocky jam. The other one takes forever to get. Crut rocky jam. Here we go. Uh, thanks a lot for having us. Yeah, really thanks thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. All right. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.